The Romans never let something as silly as originality get in the way of a good idea. Those scamps copied everything. Their gods, their myths, their statues, their columns, their military formations, the entire concept of having a navy. If they saw something useful or shiny, they took it. Intellectual property theft was the fuel that powered the empire. Also slavery, but sometimes they thought hard, dug deep, and actually created something. Shocking, I know, but with innovations like multi-generational civil wars, they really outdid themselves. Yet there is one field in which this cover-to-cover -cover disaster of a civilization truly excelled, and that is architecture. The Romans were a little late to the party, but once those engineers figured out what they were doing, they were utterly unstoppable. And there is no monument more singularly representative of Roman brilliance than the Pantheon. So, to see why this hunk of brick and concrete is the coolest and most distinctly Roman thing they ever made, let's do some domes! Woo! All that said, early Roman architecture is exactly what you expect. All the fun of stealing from your neighbors and all the time save of cutting corners while doing it. Rome mainly piggybacked off the Etruscans to the north to figure out how arches worked until they caught wind of what the Greeks were up to. Initially constrained by distance and a handful of mountains between them, Rome got a much closer look at Greek design when they conquered their way through Magna Graecia and later into Sicily. And the convenient influx of plundered Sicilian treasure gave Roman architects some inspiration for temple design. So over the next few centuries, they added more more and more Greek-style flourishes to their Etruscan-shaped temples, and by the time of Augustus, the fashion was tall, narrow buildings raised on a pedestal with one staircase leading up to the portico and main entrance. The colonnade continues around the sides of the building, but those columns are half inside the walls, so I'm not gonna say it's sloppy, but it is awkward, and... Yeah, kinda half-assed. But I'll grant the Romans that their temples were often right in the middle of densely built cities, so they didn't have the space to spend on a proper 360 colonnade like the Greeks did. Another key difference between Greek and Roman architecture was the Romans' choice of building materials. Marble was, of course, the finishing material of choice, but most of the interior structure was made of bricks or concrete. Bricks are great because they're light and stackable, you played with Lego, you get it, but concrete is really crazy because it can be whatever shape you want, you just need to pour it. These are far more versatile than huge slabs of marble, especially for making arches, and were used to great effect in Roman infrastructure like roads, bridges, aqueducts, baths, and ports. Aquatic structures especially were tricky because water tends to murder concrete within decades, but the Roman formula used volcanic ash as a binding agent, which, when coming into repeated contact with salt water, will crystallize, effectively petrifying porous concrete and turning it into one completely solid mass of stone. Holy hell, it is truly tough to overstate the genius of that concrete. And this actually brings us to our main subject, because in the early days of the Empire, Rome's number one badass Marcus Agrippa commissioned a temple in the city. It was a typical Roman temple. It also burned down. But then Emperor Domitian built a replacement temple, which also burned down because it got struck by lightning and caught fire. But then Emperor Hadrian and also probably Trajan commissioned a second replacement. And this is where it gets good. Somewhere in the late 120s AD, Hadrian completed the Pantheon, retaining the original portico of Agrippa's temple, complete with inscription, but radically redesigning the body of the structure with a dome. Rome was no stranger to building domes, since they're essentially just fussier arches, but the raw scale of this project was something else. A perfectly spherical dome with a 142-foot diameter poured from concrete with a hole in the top. This is the kind of structure you might expect to collapse, but after the first two temples fell down, the Romans were set on avoiding the embarrassment, so they busted out the trigonometry to make it as sturdy as possible. The base of the temple is a cylindrical drum that supports the dome. Its lowest third is made of thick travertine stone, the middle is a mix of limestone and brick, and the top layer is just brick. So the structure gets lighter as it goes higher. But some parts of the wall are thinner than others, because the interior has seven niches cut into the main wall. So the drum is inlaid with a series of arches to deflect downward force around the weak points and onto where the wall is thickest. Supporting the dome would likewise require some crafty thinking. Although it was a single mass of poured concrete, it employed the same weight-saving tricks as the drum. With strong but heavy travertine stone mixed into the concrete at lower levels, then transitioning to limestone and lightweight volcanic pumice mixed in at the top. The dome also tapers significantly, thinning from 21 feet at the base to just 4 feet, with extra weight saved by carving out square coffers from the interior. And looking at it from the outside, there's not much dome there, just some steppy rings with only a little actual curvature. That's because in addition to downward force, domes also push outward, so the engineers added ring supports to lock in the middle and nestled the entire bottom half of the dome within 
in the drum. And the final weight saving trick is also the ultimate flourish, the 27 foot oculus at the very top. At first glance, this goes against everything we know about keystone arches, but the third dimension makes it work because the brick ring at the top compresses on all sides and supports the dome better than if it were a solid disc. All this engineering seems like overkill, but the effort is worth it because of what happens inside. Entering through the portico of 40-foot monolithic columns of imported Egyptian granite and passing through towering solid bronze doors, the interior of the Pantheon is stunning. It's exactly as tall as it is wide, with both the dome and the drum 142 feet in diameter, so the interior feels like a perfect sphere, with the cylindrical bottom half continuing down from the dome. It's not too tall, it's not too wide, it just Fits. This was an incredible departure from early Roman temples that were all cramped and dark. This was huge, open, immaculately proportioned, and bright. The beam of light from the oculus travels around the room with the time of day and feels as if the gods themselves are peering into the space. Just as well, because at noon on April 21st, the light shines precisely on the front door to welcome the emperor for the anniversary of Rome's founding. What the hell kind of batch math were these madmen doing to figure that out? How do you even begin to calculate that? Whew. <clears throat> More than just the ultimate geometrical flex, the composition of the Pantheon bleeds Romanitas. The original pediment design wasn't a typical scene of gods, but a Roman eagle to represent the empire itself. The walls and floor are covered in marble from all over the Mediterranean, the statues of all the different gods show the breadth of their culture, and the interplay of square and circular designs all work together to create a sense of order and completeness. It's a quintessentially imperial building. Pantheon. All the gods. Gods. Everything Roman is here. Now, every famous piece of architecture is graced with a charming little design flaw, like how the Doge's Palace in Venice has misaligned windows because of a fire, or the Duomo in Florence is missing this entire section of its facade because they just didn't bother to build it. The Pantheon, for all its glory, is no different, as Agrippa's portico is distinctly not where it's supposed to be. Looking above the pediment, there's a triangular cornice 10 feet up that's just not attached to anything. This is likely where the pediment was supposed to go, except they couldn't source the 50-foot columns to reach that high. Hard enough to get the extra height in a single slab of granite, but the added thickness would have doubled the weight, so it seems they just cut their losses and built it at 40. You can't win them all, and you certainly won't. <laughs> Stay humble, Rome. The building was absolutely remarkable in its day, but its survival to the present is as much of a miracle as its initial construction. This is partially because it was the first pagan temple to be reconsecrated created as a church, becoming St. Mary of the Martyrs in 609 AD. And although the bronze cladding on the dome was removed in 663 and the marble paneling on the outside was lost to time, the core of the structure has stayed astoundingly intact. It had a couple goofy towers added in later centuries, but it was almost constantly taken care of, up through Italian unification in the 1800s when it underwent another round of major restorations to bring it up to the shape it's in today. For all the things Rome shamelessly copied, the Pantheon represents all of their greatest innovations and most unique unique qualities in one place. It's the most Roman thing they ever made. What can I say? Good dome. Thank you so much for watching. Oddly enough, I've had the idea to do a video on the Pantheon for the past, like, five years now? So I'm glad I finally got around to it. It's good. It's a good dome. What else do you need me to say about it? I said the line. Anyway, extra special thanks to our patrons, and I'll see you all in the next video.